We'll stand together. Let's quickly go to Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Jump down to verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And we'll go to verse 11. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. You can be seated. The everlasting covenant a covenant between God and man, a promise from God that he will bless him and his seed for generations as long as they were to keep his law and circumcise every child for generations to come. But any man who does not obey to this covenant, covenant, his soul shall be cut off from his people, for he hath broken God's covenant with man. Luke, we're going to go to Luke 1. I have, I have quite a bit of scripture tonight, and I would like to, to um, there's times where I've sat through a service, and the person up here has had some scripture, and um, I've tend to, I tend to get a little bit lost. And so I like to just um, remind everyone, pay attention. If you don't have your Bible, look at the screen, follow along with me, and, and don't get lost. Um, we're going to fast forward to what is believed to be approximately 18 centuries later to Luke 1, starting in verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in age. I don't know if that would be a, a, a nice way to, to call somebody old or a mean way to call someone old, but I like it. Well stricken in age. And we'll fast forward to verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he, shall be a, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. How many know that that's us? Let's say it together. A people prepared for the Lord. That's us. And um, upon hearing that, Zacharias doubts him. And he says in verse 18, sure, we'll read that. And Zacharias said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and wife, well stricken in years. When God speaks to you, it's best not to doubt him. Um, if there's one thing that he really doesn't like, it's disbelief and it's doubt. And, and um, I'm not saying that he's going to do what he did to Zacharias, to you, but it's best not to doubt God. Um, verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Well, stay with me. I know I have a lot of scripture, but I'm going somewhere. We're going to go same chapter, Luke, all the way down to 57. 
Now Elizabeth's full time had come, and she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. We're going to go to verse 59. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. Now it was custom to name the son, very strict custom, to name the son after their father. So much so that since the father was mute and he couldn't announce the name of his son, the people in the room with Elizabeth and Zacharias and their newborn son just called him Zacharias after his father. But God, God had a different plan for this child. Verse 60, and his, and his mother answered and said, not so, his name is John. They turned to Zacharias in 63, and he, and he wrote on a writing table, his name is John. And in verse 64, and his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, and he praised God. Now we're going to go to verse 67. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, now this is very important what he says. Verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. And he hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hates us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The same covenant, keep going, the oath the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, the same covenant that we heard about 1,800 years ago. Keep going. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord and to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. To give light to them that sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew, waxed strong in spirit, and was was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, so John, he's gone waxed old and went into the wilderness. And to give us the knowledge of salvation by what? Well, we know the rest of the story because John came out of the wilderness to tell us in Colossians 2, 9 to 12. For in him dwelleth all fullness of the Godhead bodily. I forgot to ask Jordan. I was going to try and press him, but... All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Here we go in verse 11. Pay close attention. In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by circumcision of Christ. Kind of confusing. At least I thought it was a little bit confusing at first. Circumcisions without hands. How? Verse 12. Right after beginning of it. Buried with him in baptism. God's plan all along. A man ordained by God to show us the way. The same covenant between God and man. No more cutting off of flesh. No more killing animals for atonement. No, ba- no just baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. A blotting out. Now, this behind me is not just a small pool of warm chlorinated water, believe it or not. It is a covenant between God and man. The same covenant between God and Abraham. It's no no different. You go down in that water. You come up forever blessed, crucified with Christ. Now, I'm closing, but quickly, the name of Moses, meaning out from the water. There's there's a lot of different, but they they all, the, the name of Moses means out from the water. Another man ordained by God to deliver the Israelite people. The Israelite people stuck between the sea and the enemy. He stretches out his rod and the sea parts and the Israelites march through. We know this. We've read it a hundred times. We learned it in Sunday school. Pharaoh commands the army, the worst decision he could make, to go after them. 
only for them to be crushed and thrown into the sea. And David sang about it centuries later in the Psalms. The horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. And just like in the days of Moses, the devil couldn't get through the water the same it is today. The devil will do all he can to stop you from getting in that tank. Everything he can. Before, he get, before you get in there, he'll do everything you can because he knows as soon as you go down and you come back up, he can't go through with you. He can't follow you through the water. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't we stand together real quick? If you haven't been baptized in full immersion in the name of Jesus, you don't want to wait another day, I promise you. Tonight is, is the night that, that eternal salvation lays, on the, lays on, on the other side of this. Tonight is the night that, that to, you know, I, I've heard Pastor, or sorry, Bishop Crawford talk about how, um, you know, people miss their chances, Right? God is, God is tugging, and I know God is tugging on people in, his, in this sanctuary right now, but people miss their chances. It's true. And um, I would be heartbroken, and we would all be heartbroken if somebody were to miss their chance tonight. Tonight is the night. Um, if, if you feel like you want to join us and you want to you get rid of the devil, um, tonight is the night to be baptized. Eternal salvation lays on the other side of that water. And if you have been baptized, I urge you to remember and to keep God's word in your heart because he can't get through that water. It doesn't matter. I was baptized, I don't know, 12 years ago. It doesn't matter if it was 12 years ago or 60 years ago. He still can't get through the water. He can't get through that covenant between you and God. Keep, keep God's word in your heart. And um, we are a marked and a, and a protected people. And I want you to remember that at heart. And um, that's all I've got for tonight. But why don't, we, why don't we lift our voices together and why don't we praise his name before Jonathan comes up. Lord, you're worthy. We thank you, Jesus, for your covenant with us, God. We thank you for your baptism, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We lift your holy name, God. We lift your holy name, God. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise God. I was a good word band. You know, there's, there's two things about baptism. One, I love that title. Me and Bishop are just saying, that's a powerful title, first off. Second thing is, not only can the enemy not touch you when you're baptized, but the second thing is, when the blood is applied to your life, Jesus can no longer see your sin. And that's a profound statement. Because when you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, that same blood that was poured out on Calvary is now upon you, meaning your sins are no longer. When God looks upon you, he sees a new person. And we can get so caught up in what the person next to us is going to think when we come to the Lord, right? I've met all kinds of people say, man, my family is going to reject me. I, I don't know what my friends are going to say about me, but I can tell you it does not matter what man says about you. But if Jesus deems you righteous and if Jesus looks upon you and says, come into my kingdom, what does it matter if a man can say or against a person who was saved and bought by the blood of Jesus Christ? Praise God. I got half the congregation with me, amen. My I don't know about you, but God has something in store for us tonight. I said it last week, but I fully believe that what God did this morning is going to be built upon tonight. Look, you can think that you just come to another service, but the glory of God is stepping in this place. And I'm telling you, if you would just begin to obey and hear the voice of God in the midst. Look, don't look at me as a preacher. Understand, I'm nothing. I'm just a vessel here to declare a word God has given me. But God's going to speak to you tonight because he wants you to know who he is. Amen? Praise God. One more time. Lift your hands. Come on. Just begin to exalt him. Come on. Close your eyes. Just begin to exalt the name of the Lord Jesus.
God. You can be seated. Praise God. God is so stinking good. He is, oh, come on. I got to add some, kind of, some kind of adjective to that one. And that's my intellect level for you right there. Stinking good. Praise God. Everyone know what I mean when I say swords up by any chance? Any young people in the room know what I mean? Sword is, is the word of God. Pastor, Hebrews 4.12. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you got it, Pastor. I know you do. Praise God. Can everyone pull, pick up their Bible if you have it with you? And I want everyone to flip to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses starting of verse 1. Whoever gets there first, can you just say amen? Amen. Oh, wow. Elder's got you beat, young people. You're slack. You don't even got Bibles in the room. Man, that's kind of upsetting. Praise God. We're going to start at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. Amen, everyone there. Praise God. It says, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Verse 2 says, And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Verse 3, And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. First Kings Chapter 8, verse 11 kind of gives you a more descriptive manner when talking about the priest. It says in verse 11, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, because of the glory. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. It was the sacrifices of Solomon and the people of Israel that created the atmosphere for God to move. But the Bible says in 1 Kings 8 and 1 that the priests brought up the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the sacrifices. They brought in what was the Word of God at the time. They contained the commandments of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was what was attached with the glory of God. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 4 it says, The glory departed from Israel when the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Something begins to get a hold of the attention of God when word and praise mix together. And in that atmosphere, you get worship. And the Lord can look upon that atmosphere where his people have not just come forth in praise, but there has been an acknowledgement and dedication of his word. The God says, my glory can Shekinah there. And Shekinah just means to dwell. And I don't mean his glory to just come for a moment. I don't mean it comes for a service. But I mean that the glory of God has come to dwell. And when you mix praise with your obedience to his word, you'll get the dimension of worship. Where God's glory can begin to Shekinah. Where his glory can begin to dwell. And what I have felt impressed for weeks now by the Holy Ghost is that the glory that we have been given, we need to maintain. It's not a life thing when God shows up the way that he does. Uh, I think some of us take such high advantage Come on, some of you have never stepped out of another church than this church. Some of you have never been to another country that are not besides this country. So you may not understand, the glory of God does not show up the way here everywhere. But the glory of God shows up with specific intention and purpose because God is getting a hold of his people and he's going to show you parts of himself other people have only dreamt of, have only prayed for, have only fasted for. The glory of God is in this house tonight. And I think it is a bad thing if we can just sit and stand in the glory of God and not budge a single inch or move. But understand when God shows up, there needs to be your response in the people of God. Praise God. And what I've come to tell you is that the glory of God is not here just to dwell. It's not here just for a moment. It's not here just for a service. But the glory of God is meant to be maintained in your life. You hear me? The glory of God is more than just the four walls of this church. Amen? Praise God. And I believe that the glory you can get in this church atmosphere is ingrained with a purpose to go with you. We're not just going to maintain it in this service. Amen? Uh, I, I believe that it's, it's not the will of God that a Christian only knows God three times a week. 
Not even three days. I'm talking about three different hours of a week. Praise God. It will be maintained and it will multiply. What I want to speak to you for a short while is on the subject of the glory of the Lord came down. One more time, can you just lift up your hands? Come on, I believe God has something in store for us tonight. I need you to look past the preacher. I need you to look past the person next to you. And I need you to get a hold of God's God. Open our hearts and open our minds. I pray right now, God, that we come into a place of submission where carnality will not dwell, where our intentions and our desires will not go beyond the voice of God. But I pray, Jesus, get a hold of every person in this room. I pray, show us your glory. Show us your glory. Show us things this world cannot give us, God. Show us the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Just begin to worship him for one more moment in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Jesus. God is so good. What it seems to me is that when the glory of the Lord appears, it's with a purpose. It's with a demonstration that there is instruction in the presence of the Lord. Oftentimes we obtain what we believe to be the climax of the glory of God and we leave. But it's in the glory of God where God begins to speak. Why? Because there has been a place of submission created before the glory descended. It's like what God spoke to the children of Israel in Exodus 33 and verse 5. It says, for the Lord had said unto Moses, say unto the children of Israel, ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. Another translation says that I may know what to do with you. Why? Because God told them to put off your ornaments because I'm about to do something. God told Moses and Israel, put away what does not concern you, what does not define you, what does not dictate your mind and your spirit, because what I'm about to do cannot be filtered by carnality. It cannot be filtered by the things society has influenced you with. Moses, I'm about to reveal to you a part of my glory others have not seen. You ever notice how you can go in a church with baggage and overwhelm mind? And honestly, it's just in a moment when the worship team begins to sing and the preacher starts preaching that for all of a sudden there's peace. For some reason, your mind that was clouded becomes clear. Because when God calls to remove, what God calls to remove from your environment is just to create the grounds for his glory to come down. Because it was Moses who saw the parts of God's glory no man has seen and no man could live to tell. The request of Moses in the presence of God was, show me thy glory. And there must be a voice in you that says, I will not go where the glory does not lead. I will not do what God does not consent. Because Moses was familiar with atmospheres of rejoicing. Moses was familiar with the atmosphere and the smell of when a priest would sacrifice an animal. But there was something different about this atmosphere. Moses knew he was about to encounter what happens in the worship dimension. Moses understood, yeah, yeah, it's great when people are rejoicing. Yeah, it's great when people receive atonement. But something of God has stepped in to not reveal flesh on the flesh, but God to man. And Israel could not comprehend what they were going to step into. See, God led Israel through a desert because the way that they lived, the way that they sought God in Egypt would not be sufficient to what God was desiring to do in the promised land. So God had to bring them through a desert and get rid of that old Egyptian men thinking, that old Egyptian mentality. And Moses had to instill in Israel that there is one God. Not many who you pray to, but there is one. And what God is seeking for is someone not experienced, someone who is not intellectual, praise God. Not someone who grew up in church. No, he's looking for somebody who will obey, somebody who will be transformed in the Christ. See, you think I got to be perfect for God to use me. Uh, you can think to yourself, I gotta get 
all my ducks in order before God can show me who he is, before God can truly anoint me. But I've come to tell you, the Holy Ghost is not a respecter of persons. It does not matter your past or your pedigree. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've said or what you've seen. It doesn't matter the fact that you may have gossiped at a point in your life. It doesn't matter if you did a drug when you were not supposed to. God does not care what you have done. All God cares about is a man or a woman of God. God, who will obey when he begins to speak when God begins to move will say God I know it's my first service I know I've never experienced you but Lord use me Jesus. because the glory of God can walk with you but what's it impacting around you what's the glory of an elder doing it's reaching the next generation What's the glory of a saint doing? It's reaching that lost soul in their city. And if they won't step into church to receive who God is, God will send the same atmosphere on a Sunday morning service with it with his servant to bring the glory to them. Yeah, God may not have known their name, but you've been anointed as a messenger to tell that soul that he knows every very number on their head. But the problem is we get our praise mixed with our worship. And we think that in an atmosphere of praise is the climax of what God is going to do. It was over a year ago, maybe two years ago, and I've, I've talked to Andrew about this all the time. But I remember God kind of dealt with me with the difference between praise and worship. See, praise in the Hebrew means to confess. And praise, there's, there's breakthrough. There's breaking of bondage. There is, there is breaking of sin or, or removal of sin in, in praise. And when there was an atmosphere of praise, it's almost like an atmosphere of sacrifice where you're putting yourself on an altar where God is restoring your soul. But then you look at worship, and the Hebrew language describes it as to bow down. That there has been a place of obedience which has created an avenue for intimacy with God. Because your praise will get you through the door. But what if I told you after your breakthrough that there was an invitation in your praise to know his glory. But the problem is we can praise, but if there is a never a demonstration of obedience or submission to the Spirit of God, there will never be worship. Meaning you can be in the presence of God, praising outwardly to the Lord. Man, you look so cute with your hands raised high, singing out loud. Man, you even know the lyrics of the songs. Praise God. Ask my wife. I don't really know lyrics of any song, but I try. I make it up as I go. You know, sometimes you mumble, mm, praise God. You know what I'm saying? It's how you do it, you know. You got you to do what you got to do. Praise God. But you can be in the presence of God, praising outwardly to the Lord, but yet still be so bounded on the inside because there was no obedience when God said, give it up. Why is he asking you to give that up? Because there is something in his glory he is looking to reveal to you. Worship is the dimension of a lingering presence of God that comes in with a specific purpose to reveal and impart what is contained in the glory of God. Praise is where you get your will out of the way. And if you don't believe me, just ask the person next to you to begin and dance before the Lord and then see how fast their flesh begins to rise up. But here's the thing. You can get to the dimension of worship without praise. But many times there must first be a dimension of praise because that will be the only place someone will obey the Lord. It will take a fast song, someone praying for you, a preacher to hype you up before you ever get to a place where you say, okay, God, I surrender my will. Okay, God, maybe I, I'll get rid of this in my life that I, I know you've reminded me for the thousandth time, but maybe now I'll, I'll give it to you. But if you submit yourself every time you open your eyes in the morning and say, not my will, Lord, but thine be done, then God will say you're ready to receive what I have been creating in my glory. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And what we often do as a Pentecostal movement is receive what we need and leave right when God is ready to speak to you. I don't know about you, but a miracle won't be the height of my worship. 
But instead, when God steps in a church service, and just as often as it happens here, begins to interrupt the service, just like it even did last Sunday night. And I always tell to Courtney, Trevor Milton, for some reason, you're the greatest preacher who never gets to preach. I feel like every time he's scheduled, I say to Courtney, is he going to preach tonight? You know, we're hopeful. We're praying for it. But, but God always just intervenes with you, bro. I don't know why. It's a powerful thing. But when God steps in, and when an atmosphere like that is created, and people are being healed and filled with the Spirit, and miracles are pouring out, or even when the gifts of the Spirit are in operation, just like it was here earlier, not even more than 30, 40 minutes ago, don't just get what you need and walk away, but begin to dwell in His glory. You know, when God shows up, you can ask God. I do this all the time. God, what are you creating in this moment? God, uh, what are you desiring to do in this moment? God, why did that just happen? Why did you just speak like that? And so many times when God begins to do something, we rejoice, we shout, we speak in tongues, and then we go home. But there's so many things that God is looking to reveal to you, things that you probably thought you would never even inherit. But my, it's in the dimension of God, and it's in this place tonight. Look, you don't see it physically, but I'm telling you, there's things in the spirit of God. God is not held to time. God is not held to the physical laws of nature. So he can create when he wants to create. He can speak when he wants to speak. He can impart when he wants to impart. And all you have to do is be a willing vessel. I don't come here to give you a magical formula. What I tell you is just to lift up your voice, to Lift up your spirit and just say, God, whatever it takes, I will put myself on this altar because I need more of you. Praise the Lord. Mm. Praise God. Instead of waiting for God to fill a checkbox, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God because God has not stepped in to just touch your physical environment but to touch your spirit. To give you the understanding of what he has created for you. Every person, lift up your hand, just one hand right now. I'm not telling us to pray. You were designed with a purpose. I'm talking to you, Naaman. I'm talking to you, Rosie. I'm talking to you, Miguel. Oh, are you definitely Miguel. I'm talking to you, Isaac. I'm talking to you, Sister Wendy. I'm talking to every person in this room. You were designed and created with a purpose. Yeah, I see you all. I see you want me to get your attention there. I understand. And you can think to yourself that God has overlooked me or God has forgotten me. But I'm telling you, if you're here and you got breath in your lungs, you were designed by the framework of God. And you were designed with a purpose to inherit the promises of God. To the glory of the Lord can come upon you. The glory of the Lord can be poured out of you. The glory of God can be revealed in you. You don't got to be the greatest preacher. You don't got to have the best suit. You don't got to be the most anointed person. But you got to have a voice and say, God, speak through me. God, I give you my will. In Jesus' name. In worship, you'll find your identity. In worship, you'll find your purpose. And I remember God dealing with me on the subject of his glory. And I mean, the glory is something you can always hear about. But I remember asking God, God, what, what maintains your glory? Because I, for me, I don't want to just experience it on a Friday youth night. I don't want to experience it on a Sunday morning or tonight, but I want to experience it tomorrow. I want to wake up on Tuesday morning and say, God, my, your glory, I feel it right now. I want to wake up out of my bed and I just begin to kneel before God and say, God, I worship you. I worship you. And all of a sudden, the glory of God just becomes a step in my room. I don't know about you, but it does not satisfy me to just feel the glory when I come to church. It doesn't just satisfy me to feel the glory because I need my bishop or my pastor with me. No, I, there's something in me that desires God so much. That says, God, when I wake up when I lay my head at night, when I go to school, when I go to work, when I go to when I do anything, God, let your glory go with me. Lift up your hands, just begin to exalt him. Come on, come on, your worship's pleasing. Come on, your worship. God desires to hear your worship.
That's it. Come on, that's it. In the name of Jesus. You feel that? That's his glory. This may be the first time in your life you've ever felt the presence of God. This may be the first time you ever felt love in your life. This may be the first time you ever felt joy or wanted. But I'm telling you, that's the presence of God. And God shows you his glory so you can know who he is. And it's not just for this service, but it's so when you get in your car, in that parking lot, and you're driving home, the glory of God is going with you. Oh, God's going to do something here tonight. Praise God. And as I was praying, I felt God dealing with me about the story of Saul. See, Saul tried to buy glory through sacrifice. It was Saul when uh, who he brought Israel to fight against the Philistines that they went into caves because they were afraid of the Philistine army. They saw how great it was. They saw all the weapons and the chariots they carried with them and said, we're just going to go into caves. And it's then that Saul gives a burnt offering unto God. And Saul had just assumed that his sacrifice would be pleasing to God. That because God anointed him, that he would just honor his decisions. That God would honor this war because Saul deemed it good. And what Saul did not realize, that though there was sacrifice, there was no obedience. I'm talking about somebody who knew how to praise, but their heart was so far from worship. It was the same thing with King Solomon when he sacrificed thousands of animals in the house of God. Saul and Solomon were both failed to maintain the glory because there was no obedience. And I thought, wow, God, it's kind of what pastor has been saying, that the only thing God puts above his name is his word. And they had just assumed because God anointed them and that God had moved them before that even in their disobedience, the glory would fall. It's this assumption attitude that corrupts a person from maintaining the glory of God because they think they can just go back to old habits and just because they received a miracle in a church service or received a call to the ministry in a prayer meeting that God's just going to be with them even when they disobey, even when they rebel, even when they go against the word of God. And praise can fool someone that their lifestyle of disobedience is righteous. Just because you feel, felt the Spirit of God in a church service, your worship expresses how unrighteous you are, and you become humble by the mighty presence of God for Christ to be revealed in you. You know what's funny? I said this to God when I was praying yesterday, or two days ago. I said, God, every year that passes by since you saved me, I don't become more arrogant. I don't begin to think to myself, oh, I, I can do things less, and I'll be okay. It's funny is that the more that I grow in Christ, the more I understand how wicked my flesh is. The more I understand how unrighteous I am. Ben, you talked about salvation. And salvation is something that goes beyond just the water. Because you can be filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name and not be saved. I understand now more than ever, every day I need the salvation power of God to save me. Every day I wake up in the morning and I say, God, I'm unrighteous. God, I'm going to sin today if I don't follow you. God, I, I'm not going to do what you want me to do if I don't get to prayer. The more that I go grow in Christ, the more I understand Jonathan Unan is not a good man. Jonathan Unan is not a righteous man. Jonathan Unan, you can't just get by with anointing, but you got to get a hold of Jesus. And I'm telling someone in this house, you got to get a hold of God. You're anointed is not enough. Your talent isn't enough. Your experience isn't enough. Your pedigree isn't enough. But there needs to be a daily communion with the Spirit of God. Because if you don't, I'm telling you, hell's going to get his grip upon you and say, another one, another one. But I claim by the authority of the name of Jesus that your soul is going to see the King of Kings one day. Praise God. Praise God. Y'all following me? Amen. I'm not preaching against praise. It's needed. It's essential. 
You will still see me praising God, and you'll even see me dance before the Lord, even until I got a bad knee and a broken hip. You know, I'm an old man. I'm going to still try my best. Praise God. But the reality is, there's too many after the fact Christians whose faith is built on those around them. A lot of times, their faith comes after the miracle. Their faith is dependent on, oh, when I get to church, my faith is dependent on other, other person's worship. And they don't realize that the miracle that was given to them was to give them enough faith to walk in the glory that's about to be revealed. Huh. What if I told you, when God show gives you a miracle, he's also wanting to show something of his nature to you. That every time God gives a son or his daughter a miracle, there's also a part of his glory he's trying to show you. And first lady, Tara, it's like you say it all the time. When you get into the atmosphere of praise that God is working upon people, it's just the entrance to what God wants to do. It's just the beginning. And I know this church knows this stuff. Man, there's so many people here with wisdom beyond my years since I was living in diapers, really. But the purpose of this message is that the glory of God, that God has been showing up service after service, we have been called to maintain and multiply. That there is not an excuse to sit back and just expect God to be there and not have to dig in prayer and in his word. But the glory you've encountered in this church, in a prayer meeting, or in one moment, God wants you to walk in and God wants you to multiply it. And the exciting part is, just like I said earlier, the glory is not dependent on how long you've been in church. It does not matter if you felt God three days ago for the first time or 30 years ago. It doesn't matter if you can quote to me 70 Bible verses or if you've never opened up the word of God in your life. The glory of God is not selective to what you got, but the glory will fall upon those who will bow down and worship to those who will Obey the Spirit of God. Praise God. Because you can look cute and fancy, but your attitude and your desires can be so far from God. But God says, how about you give me someone messy and who will listen and watch what I can do? How about give me someone who's unknown and not a single person in the church knows who they are and watch as I show you my glory? Give me someone who was addicted, who would give their life to me, and I'll show you my power. You think God shows up to demoralize you? You think God shows up to judge you? You think God shows up to condemn you? God shows up to show you who he is. Praise God. To show you his glory. To make known the parts of him that were unknown to you. There was a time in my life when I never knew who God was. But I can stand today. And I have the ability to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. You need peace? I'll show you my God. You need salvation? I'll show you my king. If there hasn't been a doctor or a center in this city that has healed you or has taken away your problem, I'll show you my God. And you watch as he begins to touch your body, soul, spirit, and mind. Praise the Lord. Mighty God. Every time God begins to speak and give a command, the devil listens and shows up, oh, there must be a miracle in there. And it's funny because the devil recognizes also what God's looking to do. And he wants to stop it before they get the miracle. So what he will do is he'll try to get the church to disobey. Try to get the church to be a little cautious. Try to get the church to be a little doubtful. Because he understands if they get what God's trying to give, they're going to be unstoppable. That there's something in them that's just going to, oh my. You know, Andrew, I want to ask you a question, bro. Before you were living for God, obviously, when you went to a bar and you went to get a drink, did you, when you got that drink, were you trying to be cautious with it? Did you ever read the label and think it was okay? He drank it, he said. My, what a dog. Did you ever look around the people around you and said, is this okay for me to drink? No. I'm sure because, I'm sure probably you probably got one drink. Drank that one, got another one, drank that one, got another one, and drank that one. Because you went there to a specific place for a specific time 
for a specific purpose because it had something that you wanted. And so it is in the church of God that we come to a specific place at a specific time for a specific purpose. And so why is it that if people are not cautious to get a hangover, why are we cautious to be in the presence of the Lord? Come on. People can be so bold in sin, but the second they get in the holy presence of God, they're like a wall. My. And I'm telling you, the only thing you're going to find at the end of a bottle is pain. But you know where you're going to, you know what the presence of the Lord can do? I don't even know if he's in this room. But it can take someone like David who was supposed to be dead and make him alive. My God. It can take someone who was so drunk like our pastor and make him whole. It can take someone who is homeless and give him a new life. Praise God. You want to know what the presence of God can do? Sorry, Pastor, I didn't hope I'd offend you in that one. Praise God. I, you know, I was debating on saying that. I, I felt conviction, praise God. But he says he was drunk when he got baptized. So, I mean, I'm just, just you know, trying to reflect. Oh, hangover, hangover. Sorry, sorry. Praise God. <laughs> my. But you can try all you want to doubt my God, but I'll show you his miracles. And you can try and tell yourself that all oh, oh, you want, that you want this, but it isn't for you. Or that God is not what you need. But let me speak to your doubt that the very fact you're sitting in this house is, shows me that God is trying to get a hold of you. God has called this church to do something Israel could not do. Maintain his glory. And you think you can think to yourself, well, we got a good. I don't have to do as much as I did before the revival because God's just going to do it. I can sit back. I can take a step back in prayer because, well, we got prayer teams now, even multiple prayer meetings. But see, it was Israel who became so spoiled through the reign of David and even the wealth of his son, King Solomon, that they neglected the fact that just because they received the promised land does not mean there was no longer an effort anymore to maintain the glory of God. The greatest issue with Israel was neglect. It was like a father who unknowingly rejects or neglects his child by never telling him he loves him because he just assumes he knows just as a nation stopped worshiping their God because they just assumed God loved them. Or that he just assumed that they knew, that God knew that they loved him. And I've come to preach to you, don't let the glory die out. And you know what makes someone obey? And don't worry, I'm almost done. This is if you're looking at the clock. You know what makes someone obey the Lord? Humility. C.S. Lewis said this, humility is not thinking less of yourself than others. All right, it's not, it's not the, those people who walk around with their head low and their shoulders down and, oh, woe is me, woe is me. Really, those people aren't humble. They're probably more stubborn than anything. But here's the whole quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Brother Eli Hernandez said this, the difference between submission and humility is submission is not when you disagree, but still obey. Submission is about losing your opinion, while humility, on the other hand, is about losing your identity. Submission is about losing your opinion, but humility goes to a different level because it's about losing who you are in order for God to reveal who he is in you. What does it matter if a man thinks you're nobody? but God's face is towards you. You know, Mark Dross said, you can think you're everything in a bag of chips, but honey, you're just a bag with no chip. Praise God. It's like how we talk about salvation. We recognize that there is a mental ascent of faith, the, the believing aspect, but there also must be a working of your faith. Like James said, that in faith, there is a place of submission required. Faith operates out of humility. Hope operates out of humility. Hope creates the avenue for faith to work in. And you want to know why God restored David over Saul? Because here's the thing. You know what's funny? David committed more sins than Saul did. And what David did was worse than Saul. Saul made one mistake, and it was over for him. David got Bathsheba's husband killed, and we never even think about what his wife felt. We never think about if the possibility, if he had kids, what they felt. We never think about what maybe his family had reacted to the death of their father or their cousin or uncle, whatever it may have been. But the difference between Saul and David is that when the prophet Samuel went to David, David humbled himself in the presence of the Lord. 
Faith attracts the glory of God, but humility keeps it. Worship keeps it and maintains it. And I talked about this last time that I preached months ago, but a lot of people pray, but not everyone has altars. Because if you have an altar, you walk in a spirit of humility where you lose your identity where you, and you gain an identity in Christ. A lot of times we can look for formulas or certain, certain ways that give a profound revelation or understanding to walk in the glory God's revealed to us. But here's the reality of what we need. What we need is to humble ourselves before the mighty God. Humility and wisdom can teach you more things than I believe even years of time can teach. Now I know as a young man that opinion kind of sounds a little worthless saying that humility and wisdom is greater than, the, than what time can teach you. But I've seen a lot of people in the word of God and in life who in their old age still were learning how to have a right attitude. Still were learning how to submit themselves. Still were learning what it meant to be humble before the presence of God. We need to be in prayer. And yes, we need to be a read our Bible. But we must also humble ourselves before the glory of the Lord. Certain things like faith attracts the spirit. But what I believe gets to the root and produces growth are people who have the right attitude, people who will obey, people who will lose their opinion and submit themselves to God. I'm almost done if the music wants to come up. Praise God. King Solomon did not understand that the glory of God had even fallen in honor of the obedience of David, his father. You read the book of Kings, and when Solomon fell into sin and led Israel into sin, the Bible says that yes, he was going to pour out judgment, but he wasn't going to do it in the reign of Solomon because out of, out of, of uh, favor or because out of respect for, what the, how, for David's reign. That what Solomon did not understand is that the glory of God continued to fall in his life because his father had obeyed the God. He thought he could let any creeping thing into his life and surely he would not fall from God. And it's the same environment we can find ourselves in this church that God moves in our gatherings in honor of the years of obedience from every elder and saint in this room. The dimension of his glory which you step in so freely week to week is founded by the obedience of men and women of God who are the world told them to dress a certain way, act a certain way, not to pray, to put work over church, to follow political agendas over their Bible, to eat and not fast, reject and not listen. They stood and worshiped the Lord. And we, and I, we think the atmosphere here that we walk in every week to week is because of us. But there's two things we must realize with the glory of God. One, God chooses to show his glory. And the second is that we are just living in what others created. Just as God honored David through Solomon, so God will honor our elders through us. And I understand this even working with our young people in this church. That I've not been called to create, I've been called to maintain and multiply. I've been called to take what has been established, what has been labored and tilled, and maintain it and make sure it goes to the next generation. You know, when we have Antioch Youth Night, it's built upon what was established before in Bible talk. And so it is with this church that, yeah, you're just living in what the Crawfords established in this church, but you have been called every person in this building to maintain what was established and watch and multiply. Because God does not give for it to be dormant. And I ask you, who will, multi- who will maintain and multiply what our bishop created? Who's going to multiply and maintain what Sister Wendy has created through prayer? Who will maintain and multiply what Brother Roger has created or, or Brother Milton has created? And if you could only see the mantles in a room full of this people who have served the Lord for so many years... And if you can understand, God can give it on to you and give it to you greater. Not for the purpose to receive it and then hide it. No, that's what our pride likes to do. Our pride likes to get what we have from God and just keep it to ourselves. But God wants, this is the purpose of the glory of God. And I want want you to come here. I want you to take my hand. Come here, man. The purpose of the glory of God is to maintain it in this generation and multiply it, all right? Name, I want to ask you a question, bro. Do you think you can maintain what those elders have done in prayer? Charlie, I want you to come here for a second. Take my hand too, man. 
I want you to come over here. I want you to look at this church, and I want you to say, can you maintain what they have sacrificed for? Cade, can you come here for me? I want to ask you the same question, Cade, all right? When you look around this building and this church, do you think you can maintain and multiply what these people have established? And when I ask this question, it's funny, I get blank, blank stares. It's kind of daunting, isn't it? Right? You look upon the people around this building and you think to yourself, how could I carry on what they did? And that's why I also think it's so significant that in the church we don't intimidate one another. But elders, we need your encouragement that, that you will encourage these young men and women of God who are looking to establish themselves in a relationship with Christ. That when they fall, you can tell them you can rise back up. That yeah, maybe you may have fallen in sin, but you can rise up again. Yeah, maybe you thought that God was done with you, but you can rise again. That yeah, maybe you thought that I've messed up too much and I, and I don't know if God can do what he has done in the past, but you can rise up because what I believe is that the glory of the Lord is going to go from the previous generation and it's going to meet this generation just like you said, Andrew. And you know what's it going to do? It's going to multiply. It's going to multiply that the glory that was with the people from before us us from before me is going to meet the glory of this generation and God is going to multiply it to this world in the name of Jesus you guys can be seated praise God amen but there's another generation that needs to walk in what you've established praise the Lord my I feel the glory of God coming in such a strong and powerful way, in a way that I cannot even comprehend. If you want to stay with me, praise God. Oh, my. Andrew, you feel the rain coming? You feel the rain coming? Praise God. Can we just look toward heaven like Brother Roger did in that dream? And can you just picture the rain coming down? Can you just begin to see that the rain and the glory of God is going to be poured out upon a church? We are a people who have fallen short, who have missed the mark, but by your unrighteousness, in your disobedience, you still have a God looking in the midst to show His glory. And you can think that's foolishness, but I'll call it mercy that the Lord is still with us here in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Mighty God. I don't even feel deliberately to even, you don't have to come to the altar right now. But the glory of God is here in this place. One more time, I want you to lift your hands. And I want you to begin to worship Him. And now in this time, you're going to say, Lord, I give you myself. Here I am, Lord. Use me. And I'm telling you, in that place where praise meets obedience, you'll get worship. And the glory of God is going to pour out upon this church, church. Come on. That's it. Just begin to worship the Lord in the name of Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. Hallelujah, mighty God. God, I pray against every resistance in this room. 
every spirit, God, that has been hurt, every spirit that has been weighed down. And I pray, God, that there be a liberty in the Holy Ghost, Jesus, that we're going to rise up in the glory of the Lord, and that glory is going to go with us. We're going to maintain what you've given us, and God, it's going to multiply. It's going to multiply in our homes. It's going to multiply in our workplaces. In the name of the Lord Jesus, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. This altar is open right now. If you want to come to the front, praise God. Hallelujah. My God. may have felt a little long but I felt such a need that we must understand that yeah the glory's here yeah the presence of God is showing up week after week after week but my God we must continue to still maintain what God has given us and God is going to multiply a church amen and right now, if you need something from God, I want you to just lift up your hands and just begin to worship Him. Because in the glory of God, in that place of worship, when your will is not in the way, God can begin to pour out the miraculous. Jesus, I pray that in this place, God, I pray heal every mind, heal every spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, that whatever we walked in with that has weighed us down, that has hindered us from walking in you, I pray, God, let there be a liberty in our spirit. God, be with us, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah.